Good morning. Thank you. This is the first sermon of the Lord's Prayer trilogy. Jesus taught this prayer when he was preaching on the mountain side. Bible interpreter called Jesus' sermon series the Sermon on the Mount. Because the Lord's Prayer is part of the Sermon on the Mount, I will explain the prayer in the context of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And I pray that your prayer life will be enriched by a deeper understanding of the Lord's Prayer and that you enjoy the Father in your communion time. I'll read the scripture text, Matthew 6, 6 through 9. And when you pray, you are not to be as the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners in order to be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. Pray then in this way, Our Father who art in heaven. Earlier in his teaching, Jesus admonished his disciple, Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. The righteousness of many Pharisees and scribes whom Jesus encountered were superficial. They acted piously to attract attention and to gain praises from people. That's why Jesus warned the disciples, be careful not to display your righteousness merely to be seen by people. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. Besides prayer, those Pharisees and scribes also parade their righteousness in their giving and fasting. Now, their acts of giving, praying, fastings were not the problems, but their underlying motives were. Their motives are to attract people's attention so that others will praise them in giving, people could see them in praying and fasting. So those acts per se are not a problem, but their underlying motives are. Jesus taught the disciples three things about doing right. First, when you do right, do right in God's sight and not in the eyes of men. And Jesus exhort the disciples to give. Give with the awareness that God is watching. So he said, when you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, we may have a problem if everyone in church were to give a large sum of money not wanting to be named then the church will have a large sum of unaccountable income. An external auditor might suspect something illegal like money laundering. So when making a donation, you may give your name to the church for accounting purpose, yet stating you want to remain anonymous in the bulletin's announcement. Now remember, Jesus is not forbidding the donors to reveal their names. He is warning about wrong motive. Then Jesus exhort the disciples to pray for God to listen, not for other people's ear. He said, whenever you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father in secret. It is not wrong to tell other people that you are praying for them. They might be encouraged to know you are praying for them. Sometimes too many prayers in secret may lead people to think, Nobody cares for them. Nobody is praying for them. So it's all right to tell people, I'm praying for you. And then Jesus exhorted the disciples to fast with the awareness that God is attentive to their pious devo devotion. He said, when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that you will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is in secret. 
Now, the first thing that Jesus taught about doing right is do right in God's sight, not in people's eyes. Secondly, Jesus repeatedly warned the disciples that should they give, pray and fast to get attention, then attention shall be all the reward they'll get. You take note of the clause. They have received their reward in full. This is repeated uh, three times as a serious warning. Jesus teaches the disciples that God can see clearly their giving, praying and fasting that are done in secret. You see the, the clause, your father who sees in secret will reward you, is also repeated three times as an emphasis. Your father really knows the good things you are doing. And Jesus assured us, our Heavenly Father is fully aware of the good we do in secret and He will surely reward us. Now what if I have mixed motives? Sometimes our motive for doing something good can be good and also there's a bit of wrong, not 100% good, they are mixed. We have good motive as well as the bad ones. Now, if we are aware of having mixed motive, do we stop doing what is right? No. We may ask God to purify us of the wrong motive. And we may pray, God, please cleanse me, purify me of my wrong motive. Purify me of my selfish motive for doing these good things. And we may pray like David in Psalms 139, 23. Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts, and see if there's any grievous way in me. Lead me to your everlasting way. So, we may ask God to purify our motive, that what we do can be accept acceptable to Him. Now, let's give attention to Jesus' teaching about proper praying. One, Never use prayer to draw attention. Uh, we have seen that in Jesus' rebuke of the Pharisees and the scribe earlier. Two, don't treat prayer as some form of ritual. And Jesus admonishes against treating prayer as ritual. He said, when you're praying, don't use meaningless repetitions as the Gentiles do. For they suppose that they'll be heard for repeating the words. And here are some common Rituals we can see today. One is superstitious ritual. Some people treat prayer like chanting magical words to make things happen. And then we see legalistic ritual. I pray because my pastor asked me to pray, my elder asked me to pray, so I pray law. Otherwise, every week you ask me, you pray or not? Then we see wayang, wayang pietism. That is, a people who are outwardly religious, but very sad. Sadly, their inner life, their walk, does not match their worship life. On life. So Jesus tells the disciples that God already knew what they need before they ask. Therefore, he said, therefore, don't be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. King David also testified the same thing about God. He said, Before a word is on my tongue, you know about it already, O Lord. Then this leads to an interesting question. If God already knew what we need, why do we still need to pray? Is God unaware of some of my needs? Does he need reminders? So I pray to remind God, hey, how come you take so long to answer? Now, John Calvin gives us six reasons in his work, The Institutes of Christian Religion, Book 3. And I'll give a summary of Calvin's three-page explanation. Calvin's first reason is, prayer assures us that God responds to our asking. Prayer keeps us from becoming idle and lazy in approaching God. 
we often receive without having to ask, then we might become complacent, taking God for granted. Calvin's second reason is prayer reminds us that all blessings come from God. Yes, prayer makes us grateful to the blessings we receive. And we will value much more the thing we receive through prayer. We will value the things because we ask them in our prayer. And the third reason, prayer leads us to witness God's providence. God does intervene in human affairs, and His providence is very real. And God intervenes because He cares. And God will provide, and will, will provide for us even though we feel weak. We feel that we have no faith in our praying. Nevertheless, God will provide because He cares. So, in summary, John Calvin was saying that the Lord instructed us to pray, not for God's interest, but all for our sake. You see, in our prayer, we get to interact with the living God. Now, let's learn about Jesus' teaching about approaching God in prayer. One, Jesus taught the disciples to pray in a common dialect. As Jesus spoke Aramaic to the people in his ministry, Aramaic is a Jewish dialect. Many Bible scholars surmise that Jesus taught the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic, and this Aramaic version of the Lord's Prayer was later translated to Greek in the Matthew Gospel. Now, this bit of information, the trivia information, is encouraging because it means that we don't have to use Hebrew to pray. Hebrew is a sacred language to the Jews, and they will use Hebrew to pray, read the scripture in their worship. And similarly, the Arab had to use Arabic to pray and to read the Quran in their worship because Arabic is their sacred language. There was a time the people in the church, before the Reformation, the people in the church had to sing and pray in Latin, language they could not understand because that is a sacred language. So by teaching the, the prayer in Aramaic, Jesus was casting aside Jewish tradition of approaching God with so-called sacred language. And this tells us that the Father does not require us to use any sacred language. We can pray in the dialect we speak, the language we use. Now, how do we address the Lord God Almighty? Jesus told his disciple, just call him Abba, Father. Calling God Abba is casual and also mind-blowing to the Jews and as well to other people. Let's see what the Roman addressed their God. The Roman had to use long salutation to pray to their gods and they must be careful to use all the correct titles otherwise their god might be offended as the caesar was treated as a god the people had to pray to caesar with long salutation a fourth century historian called eusebius he recorded long salutation galerius caesar's demanded it goes something like this Emperor Caesar, Galerius, Valerius, Maximinus, Vinvictus, Augustus, and so on, so on, so on. God, our King, is far greater and He deserves a much longer salutation. However, God is not egoistic. Jesus says, Oh, just call him Father. Now, let's see what the Jewish people address God. The Jewish people will address God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They also call God King of the universe when they give thanks for their food. However, Christians may address this same God as Abba because Jesus invited us to call the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Abba, Father, Abba is an endearing term, and this term affirms a 
personable relationship between God and us. Many years ago, many preachers would equate Abba with the term daddy. But today, with the rise of many so-called sugar daddies, daddy has become somewhat derogatory. But there's still another term that's appropriate that is uh, equivalent to Abba, that is Papa. Some people might feel, I'm not worthy to God, call God Father. Yes, other people can call God Father. You can call God Father, but I don't deserve it. I don't feel worthy. In this gospel, the Apostle John tells all believers that Jesus has given every believer the rights to be God's children. And as God's children, God welcomes you to call him Father, whether you feel worthy or not. And John said, but to all who receive him, receive him means those who believe in his name. Jesus has given the rights to become God's children. And as God's children, you have the right and it's appropriate to call God Father. So whenever we call God Father, we should be grateful to Jesus for sharing God's fatherhood with us. And because of Jesus' invitation, God is now our Father. You will not feel or be offended. Now the Lord's Prayer begins with the address, Our Father who art in heaven. There are three interpretive questions that will help us understand the first line of this prayer. Who is this father? Where is this father? And what is this father like? Now the first question, who is this father? He is the father in heaven. Heaven connotes that the father is majestic. The father God is majestic as seen in the beauty of his creation. God is majestic in his glory in heaven. God is majestic in his holiness. So when we pray, our Father in heaven, let's be mindful, we are approaching the presence of the majestic God. So how should we approach this majestic God? Should we say, Hey man, you lousy God, are you sleeping or what? Why ain't you listening to our prayer? No, that is no respect at all, insolent. When Isaiah encountered the holy and majestic God, he heard the angel praising the Lord continually, holy, holy, holy. He cried out, Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. You see, Isaiah was a holy prophet. But in God's holy presence, this holy man of God felt like an unclean Gentile, common people, unclean people. Isaiah perceived that his sleep, representing his whole person, was unfit to praise God. So our Father who art in heaven is a line that reminds us we have now come before the same holy and majestic Lord that Isaiah stood before. And such awareness should evoke in us a sense of awe, reverence, and stillness. Now, where is this Father? He's in heaven. Heaven denotes a transcendent realm, and that realm is far, far away, way up high. In our society, many very, very important people are also transcendent-like. They are not approachable to us. Some are approachable but not available. We might have to wait months for an appointment. And sometimes when the appointment comes, the meeting session is very short, quick and short. We have to go. But Jesus taught us an encouraging truth about the Father, this very, very important person who is in heaven. One, person, one disciple asked Jesus, how is it that you are revealing yourself to us and not to the world. And Jesus told him, because you love me, you are obeying my teaching. So my father loves you and my father and I will come to you. 
Jesus' reply contains a promise to us. John 14, 23, If anyone loves me, he will obey my word, and my Father will love him, and we, we will come to him, and we will be with him, living together. This means that we can experience the Father's presence wherever we are, although it's far, far away, way up high in heaven. In your living room, the Father is there with you. In your office or in your classroom, the Father is there with you. And when you are walking home, sometimes feeling discouraged, the Father is there with you. The Father walks with you. The Father is always with us, and that's because the Holy Spirit connects us with this Father who is in heaven. The Apostle Paul teaches us that God is with us because our body has become God's temple. Don't you know that you yourself are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? Then Paul teaches us that the Holy Spirit assures us that we are God's children. He said, you have received the spirit of sonship and by him, the Holy Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself testify with our spirit that we are God's children. Therefore, when we call God Father, we are intimately bonded with God in the father-child relationship. And God is always approachable, personable to us. When we come before our Father, He will not say, what do you want? I'm very busy. Can you be quick? Don't dilly-dally. No. Instead, He will tell us, I have not heard from you for quite a while. Are you very busy? Oh, take your time to talk to me. I'm in no hurry. Okay. Now, the third interpretive question, what is this Father like? Our Father is the Creator God. And Psalm 104 illustrates vividly what our Creator God is like. And verses 10 through 15, we learn that the Creator God continually sustains His creation. We read, He makes springs pour water into the ravine. It flows between the mountains. They give water to all the beasts of the field. The wild donkey quench their thirst. The birds of the air nest by the waters. They sing among the branches. He watered the mountains from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied by the fruits of his work. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for men to cultivate. Bring forth food from the earth, wines that gladden the hearts of men, oil to make his face shine, and bread that sustain his heart. The trees of the Lord are also well watered. And verses 17 through 18, we read, we learned, God provided suitable habitats for all the creatures as their homes. We read, there the bird makes their nest. The stock has its home in the pine trees. The high mountains belong to the wild goats. The creeks are refuge for the conies. And verses 14 to 23, we learn that God marks the time and seasons by the sun and the moon. The moon marks off the season. The sun knows when to go now. You bring darkness, it becomes night, and all the beasts of the forest prowl. The sun rises and they steal away. They return and lie down in their dens. Then man goes out to his work, to his labor until evening. And verses 24 to 25, we learn God fills the seas, land and skies with many kinds of wondrous creatures. And we read, How many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures, there the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond numbers, living things both large and small. A British composer, John Rudder, composed a song, Look at the World. The song lyric rephrases, summarizes, and also responds 
to God's creation. The song described the creative work of God that we read in Psalm 104. Another person, a cameraman, produced a video that sing with Look at the World lyrics. And he, he, he used many inspiring shots to illustrate God's creation. We will watch this video after the sermon. So in conclusion, let's recap the key points. One, Jesus exhorts us to give, to pray and to fast with the awareness that God is watching. Never use prayer to draw attention to yourself. Don't treat prayer as some form of riches. Prayer is a father-child communion. And that communion, Jesus allows us to pray in any language or dialect. Our Father in heaven is transcendent, but the Holy Spirit connects us to our Father in heaven, wherever we are. And most of all, Jesus invites us to call this Creator God, Abba, Father. Let's look at the video now.